One of the biggest issues that we face now as a country, as a society, it concerns the freedom of speech and the power of corporations to regulate speech by um, giving some people platforms and some not. Recent events in uh, DC in particular have brought this into very sharp focus. Um, if I were to own a platform and I were to believe rightly or wrongly that someone were using my platform, my social media platform, to uh, potentially harm another in the sense of actual, actually inciting violence, in the, ascent, in the sense of um, harm being imminent potentially as a result of something my platform was being used to say or to promulgate, then I might well remove that user from my platform. Um, it is possible that in good faith, this is why Donald Trump has been removed from the platforms he's been removed from, and not just him, but also some others. Now, of course, many people who might be sympathetic to Trump or indeed just very firm uh, anti-censorship or pro-free speech advocates um, will say that's baloney or maybe even beside the point because it is clear that the platforms that we have, our social media platforms, Twitter, Twitter Facebook or whatever, um, long before the riots in DC have been kind of curating content. They've been picking and choosing um, who can uh, put out their ideas, make their statements on their platforms. Um, and it certainly appears to many people um, and to many reasonable people that this curation of content is not, let's say, politically neutral. There is bias. We have an issue, therefore. We have an issue, which is that um, there are private property rights uh, that owners of social media platforms can uh, legally and morally um, use, assert to remove um, people from their platforms. On the one hand, there are those rights. But on the other hand, there's um, an issue of free speech that doesn't seem to be completely just dealt with by saying, well, these these um, social media platforms, they're, they're private entities, they can do what they want. Obviously, free speech protections, um, you know, don't extend to requiring other free actors, private actors, to use their property in certain ways. Um it's a bit of an, uh, a kind of an immovable, you know, object meets an irresistible force uh, situation. And I say that because if we just let these um, potentially and probably, in fact, actually uh, biased organizations, private organizations, choose who gets to use their platforms um, when their platforms are de facto the public square now, then we clearly have a problem of impingement of free speech. So what do we do? How do we resolve this? How can we formulate a situation where private entities, companies like Twitter and Facebook, etc., can't just pick and choose um based on, let's say, the ideology of the posters, who gets to post, or indeed, um, they don't get to be the arbiters of uh, truth in statements, eliminating statements on their platforms that they think might be false, um, but perhaps may not be. Um, how do we resolve this? How do we ensure that these gatekeepers, these kind of yeah, they're kind of the keepers of private gates to a public space, right? Almost. Um, how do we make sure that they don't abuse that? Um, without, without requiring that in actual instance of ins instances of incitement, when there is actual intent to cause harm to other people, that they cannot act 
accordingly. Um, I think, well, for, that's the question. That's the big question, it seems, of our time, actually. Um, and I think, well, the first thing to say about the answer to that question is the answer will only be reached with a humilitarian approach to the question. Um, to find out what I mean by that, go to humilitarian.us. We need an approach where people who have different sympathies, some who may be very strong pro-free speech advocates, some who may be very strong pro-private property rights advocates, um, and everybody in between. Uh, indeed, I should say at this moment, people who may be sympathetic to, let's say, Trump, um, and those who certainly are not, and everybody in between, they're going to have to take a humilitarian approach to the problem, by which I mean remembering that only if they hear the other side out, only if they consciously choose to find a solution that is going to work because it is deemed reasonable by a majority of Americans, um, that is not absolutist in the sense of completely ignoring or denying um, deep moral intuitions and may, perhaps even um, f philosophical positions, deeply held philosophical positions of uh, other people, of indeed political opponents. All those things, these intuitions and considerations of folks with different sympathies, with a different perspective on this, um, have to be respected. We have to have a dialogue where they can be aired in an environment of trust um, so each side knows that the other side is going to listen to them because the other side indicates a willingness to listen to them because they actually want to find a solution rather than grandstand on an extreme position. Um, there are ways of doing that. As I say, go to humilitarian.us to find out those ways. Um, it is my strong suspicion that squaring this circle, uh, if I can call it that, comes down to the fact that a corporation is not a person. It therefore does not have natural rights. Now, I'm aware that in law, um, by legal precedent, uh, corporations have personhood. People on the left and on the right, um, libertarians and progressives, I'm thinking in particular of Ron Paul, um, have pointed out that this is um, kind of an absurd position to give companies the privileges of, or the, rather the rights of personhood in law when they don't have the responsibilities. They can't have them because they're not actually people. Um, the absurdity of this, of course, is, is indicated by... Um, well, by, for example, the fact that a company can be owned. A person can't be owned. Uh, we don't countenance the owning of people. We call that slavery, and we're disgusted by it, as we should be. But apparently, companies can be owned, and yet they have the rights of people. This is absurd. Um, when a person with rights uh, abuses the rights of another, they um, will be criminally prosecuted, and they go to jail. Their liberty is removed. Um, in extreme cases, they may be faced with a death penalty. Their life may be terminated. There is no equivalent, of course, for companies. When a company engages in criminal activity, um, uh, we, we, we don't shut them down. We don't put them in metaphorical prison. We don't really have a way of doing that. We fine them a little bit. No, that's not equivalent to putting a person in prison. So, so the point I'm making is um, the argument that says that... Um, you know, th the private property rights, let's say, of Facebook are identically those of a person, an individual, um, seems to be flawed in principle, um, which are, wherever you are on the political spectrum. Natural rights adhere to natural persons. Um, this relates to that issue of baking the cake, right? Can a baker be forced to um, bake a cake 
uh, let's say if you're a Christian baker, do you bake the cake for the gay wedding? Um, is that an infringement of your religious liberty? If you are, um, uh, if you are uh, religious and your religion causes you not to support gay marriage, for example, seems to me that the answer to that is um, well, it depends if you are an individual or if you are a company, because because you are not a company, if you are talking about a company. If um, I am Robin Kerner the baker, um, I get to choose who I make cakes for. If I am Robin Kerner Bakery, Inc., well, then I have entered into um, a an agreement with the state. I am incorporated, um, which means I get certain privileges that the state grants me because I am a company. My tax position is different. Um, all kinds of things are different. Um, now, since that is an agreement with the state, with the government, if we allow the existence of corporations and we just allow that fact, then, then we can allow, can we not, that... Um, well, we more than allow, we actually do this now, that there are certain things you can't do as a company. Um, in other words, you don't get these, let's say, tax breaks um, unless you follow this set of rules. It seems to me then that we can find a rights-based solution to this conundrum where priv- private gatekeepers that control public communication squares can be prevented from abusing uh, that gatekeeping role whilst still being allowed to uh, exercise a property right in their assets that allows them to prevent their assets from being abused, from doing harm to other people. Um, we can do it because, your pri- as I said earlier, just to be clear, the private property rights of a company, indeed the rights of a company in general, are not the rights of a person. Um, now, one might object by saying, oh yeah, but you can't possibly build a Facebook or a Twitter as an individual except by um, setting up a corporation. And so you're forced into this agreement with the state, with the government. Um, if you want to, you know, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to build a business, if you're going to build a social media platform, that's a reasonable objection. Um, the point being, of course, well, you're making someone, uh, you're, you're forcing someone into agreement where they where they're having to give up rights to operate as an economic actor. Okay, fair enough. Um, But what I'm trying to... And and that can be discussed, but now we have a discussion um, there in principle as to whether uh, that should be the case, right? Um, Whether individuals should be able to... Whether whether law should enable individuals to do things that companies can do, um, that... Individuals should have access to the economic privileges that companies have access to. That's kind of a, another question. Um, but all the while we have the current system where corporations that do not have the natural rights of people because they are not people, um, that those corporations are corporations you know, with under a privilege given by the government, um, that's the opportunity we have to find a rights-based solution to this. The opportunity we have to constrain companies like Facebook and Twitter from biasing the access they provide to people um, according to those people's views. Without... Without... Uh, preventing them from shutting down access when that access is going to be used to do harm. Now, that's just where I would start 
as I say, in squaring this circle, in resolving this this kind of rights paradox. Um, it might not be the best place to start. You may have a better idea. Um, and if you do, you know what? Please uh, comment on this on this video. But whatever idea we're going to come up with, we cannot we cannot simply grandstand as a population with some of us being how absolutely outrageous that, that Trump should be shut down. Um, if indeed there's any possibility uh, that um, you know, he's involved in, in incitement of violence. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand saying, um, well, it's absolutely uh, outrageous that um, Trump should be able to say what he's saying on those platforms and of course he should be shut down and it does you know and there's no nothing to worry about here with respect to free speech the point is maybe he should be shut down but there's also something huge to worry about with respect to free speech because of the power of twitter and facebook etc to shut him down that's the thing i'm trying to resolve here and that's the thing that we as a population as a society need to resolve very carefully in law and it can't be done um, you know, by the um, hardcore, let's say, a liberal left on the one hand and the hardcore, let's say, libertarian anarchists on the other. You know, they're not going to have the answers that the um, that the country is going to be able to settle on. Uh, one of the humanitarian principles is the only the only um, legitimate ends of politics are people. That's people, not ideology. Um, and you know, ideologies have to serve people, not the other way around. Um, you know, it may be that there is a kind of ideologically purist answer that is optimal to this, but I very much doubt it. I can't see it. Um, you know, I'm a big, big, big free speech component uh, uh, advocate, um, but you know, I am quite happy to observe that in certain contexts, speech can be used to directly initiate violence and harm. Um, in other words, there are limited circumstances in which speech can be an act of aggression. Um, you know, and so we have reasonable uh, laws against incitement and indeed libel and slander. Um, I think I actually remember Scalia, Antonin Scalia, no, you know, no progressive, no leftist there, um, saying, um, although I need to check this, but I think he was the one who said that um, for what it's worth, the founders' protection of the freedom of speech was not intended to protect lying. Um, now, maybe in its enforcement, it has to protect lying. Um, but the reason I mention this is because lying can do damage. And um, I certainly think a reasonable person could say, and I'm not saying anything in particular follows from this, I just want to make the observation that part of where we've come to as a nation um, with respect to January the 6th, um, but not exclusively January the 6th, um, it's, it's, we've come to it because of the accumulation of lies. Um, lying is very, very dangerous. Um, you know, I in the last year or two, have been a victim of um, criminal harassment. And I was actually, somebody actually threw a punch at me and um, and threatened me very specifically. And it was scary and it was ongoing. And when the uh, police officer came on one of the occasions to um, take the police report, she saw security video footage of one of these incidences and she was quite shocked and she said to me that she believes that she observed two crimes being committed against me in the in the footage and um and we talked about how i might protect myself from this individual and she asked me this officer what am i most scared of and i had to think about that and i said i know this might sound weird but i think i'm most scared of the fact that this individual who committed this crime can lie so easily. Um, I've had dealings with him over quite some period. I said, I'm actually most scared that he can just lie, that he does it all the time, sometimes when it doesn't even benefit him. Because 
if you can lie easily, then all bets are off for what can be expected of you, from what you can do, what you can defend, what your moral boundaries are. I, I think it's easier to deal with an, a violent person who's honest than someone who, well, may be violent or have violent intent, but who is completely dishonest. So there's an issue. There's an issue. Um, and let's prioritize resolving the issue, addressing the issue, coming up with a moral and legal formulation that maximally protects free speech, that maximally prevents public platforms, even if privately owned, from being used to bias political discourse and even elections, but also maximally protects the rights of owners of assets that may be used um, for communication purposes, like Facebook and Twitter, to ensure that those assets are not used by some to abuse others. What are we going to prioritize? Let's prioritize getting to the solution, listening to each other, which means recognizing that, that very reasonable people can be very fervently committed to principles that are maybe in tension with those that we prioritize. Those principles nevertheless have to be considered. Thank you.